Hey guys, Retro Tech Chris here. Nice to see you again. I realize it's um, <clears throat> been a little while since I've made a video, so thanks for sticking with me. I appreciate it. <laughs> but it's time to uh, get back at it a little bit. Plus, I have this really cool machine that I wanted to show you. It's a Dell Precision 220 workstation. And I picked it up uh, last week at a thrift store for about $25. Now, since then, um, well, I decided to uh, improve it. So, well, we'll talk about it. Uh, but in any event, this is a uh, Pentium 3 system, a dual processor, and presently has a gigabyte of memory, presently has one gigahertz processors, so nice and zippy, and a ton of operating systems because I went a little crazy. So tell you what, Let's take it apart. Let's have a look at it. Let's look at some of the operating systems on it. And I think that will uh, pretty much do it. So let's go. So I actually haven't had this PC in my possession for very long. I bought it last week when one of my social media followers tipped me off that it was available at the Chantilly Reeves store in Chantilly, Virginia. And well, it followed me home. From there, I got to doing some upgrades. And the first thing I found was this mystery board, a compact board with two processors, and I had no idea what their speed was, and I wasn't about to ask. I also purchased this regulator module that you see here, but I actually didn't need it. The motherboard that I received had two of them on it. And I also ordered two 512 megabyte RAM bus sticks. I also ordered this processor for the heatsink you see here, but as it ends up, it was actually a little bit short and those little plastic clips were a real pain in the butt. So I ended up not using it. So how do you take a cheap PC and turn it into a more expensive PC? Well, you let an enthusiast get a hold of it. We can see that we started out with a purchase price of $26.50. And by the time I bought all of these upgrades, we were just north of $156, which, you know, for what we have here, I guess, isn't the end of the world. So let's get to tearing this thing down. First, we'll have a look at the front of it, and you can see it is very tall in stature. Quite tall, in fact. I love how it has those two optical drives there. Very simple reset button and a power button. And this case really does kind of look like a generic case. We can see that this system was also quote unquote designed for Windows 2000, Windows NT4, and Windows 98. Here we can see the back of the PC, and I'm telling you, these are more Palo Alto design cues. But we can see all of our I.O. This PC has integrated sound and Ethernet, which is really nice, but not integrated video or, well, a modem. Let's get the side cover off. It's just one button push and the whole left side of the machine comes off just like that, nice and easy. Here we can see an inside of that panel, which tells us where various components are located. Next, we'll go ahead and remove the front of the PC. We push this little green bar forward and it pops right off lickety split, very nice. And now we can see what the front of the PC looks like with the cover removed. And here you can see the various plastic panels. This is from an earlier time when I had it disassembled. I was going to retrobrite all three pieces. However, only the front panel fit in my retrobrite bin, so that's all that we did. And we can see there's a bit of a variance as a result of that, but it's okay. I also took the opportunity to retrobrite the CD-ROMs, and I'm very happy with the results. Okay, let's have a peek inside, and I'll lift up the power supply here. It's one little push and you can pull the whole power supply up, revealing access to the memory and other parts of the board. Let's disconnect the power and the data cable for those optical drives and we can pull them out. And it's nice and easy. That's the whole concept of this PC is a nice, easy design for working on it. So two pushes on those clips there. We can pull the first optical out. It's a nice Sony drive that we can see here. And two more clips and we can pull out this light on drive. And you can see that here once I pull off the connector for the audio. And there that is. I'll also pull the floppy drive out. And it's a bit of a pain to get back in if you don't put it in first. 
but here it is, a faceless floppy drive. All right, let's go ahead and pull out the hard drive. So to do that, we open this little front cage and then we can pull on the clips a little bit and it'll pop all the way down and we can pop out this drive cage. Now I'll try to pull that drive cage out. It's a bit of a struggle. This machine is not new and things have gotten a little bit jammed, but that's okay. Anything that's a struggle is worth it, right? <laughs> so after struggling for a while, you can see I eventually get the drive cage out. We can have a look at it with the one drive in there. And yeah, that's a pretty good chunk of metal if you ask me, not too shabby. Okay, let's get to pulling out those processors. First, we'll remove this green shroud via those little push-ins right there. If I had the right heatsink installed, we would have to push on both of them, but I only have one proper heatsink installed, but that's okay. And we actually get to undo these screws. That's the way it's designed. I only have this again on one of the two heat sinks, but that's fine. And from there, we can go ahead and pop out these nice slot one processors. Again, these are one gigahertz. I'll get the first one out here and we'll have a look at it. Those nice cooling fins to keep this thing nice and cool. And we can look at the front of the processor and I'll try to <laughs> make it so you can read the reading there, but it, well, the camera didn't quite capture it. Oh, well. Moving on, we'll get the second one out. I like this compact heatsink actually, and we can see this processor does have a compact sticker on it since it came from a compact motherboard. Now we'll pull out this fan in the back and it's a royal pain. I really struggled with it for a little bit. The beauty of photo editing, video editing, so you don't see my struggles. Nice Dell impression on the fan there. And it's just a very nice little dirty fan. It could use some cleaning. And next we're gonna pull out this voltage regulator module. Out it goes, and you can see it here. Uh, it's necessary for that second processor to get the voltage it needs. All right, I'm gonna take the memory out now, those two 512 megabyte sticks. And sorry, my camera didn't focus, but you can read at least one of them, these nice RDRAM modules with the heat shields on them, which are really a sight to behold. Let's get this video card out, which actually is a PCI card, even though this machine does support AGP. I put a PCI card in here because I wanted to use this system with older operating systems. More on that in a minute. This nice cross piece here, which also has this little lever on it to put pressure on the AGP card and I guess keep it in its slot. Kind of a strange design if you ask me. We'll pull the PCI video card out. It's an ATI All-in-Wonder Pro card. I just happen to have around and it does the job nicely in this computer. And we'll pull out this little modem as well. We won't be doing anything with it today or probably ever, but hey, it came with it, so there you have it. Next, I'll take the motherboard out. We'll get all the cables disconnected here to make that nice and easy. And this motherboard is actually held in with one screw. That's it, one single screw. So with the cables disconnected, we can take out that one solitary screw that you see there. And once we get it out, it's a matter of just sliding the board back and it pulls right out nice and easy. How about that for ease of installation and maintenance? I'll take it. Out comes the board. We'll try not to wreck anything here. It's a little difficult to get out, but there it is. And we have the board out. Let's take a look at it. Nice board there with PCI slots, our processor slots, etc. And we'll take a closer look at it here in a minute as well. Here we go. We have our PCI slots and an AGP slot our two processor slots, the voltage regulator module slot, and our SIM slots, or whatever you call them, RAM bus slots. Very nice. I'll go ahead and reassemble everything now just so you can see it. And plus, because it's going to be easier to do this now than when the motherboard is back in the system. First and second processor in, put in those thumb screw things, and we'll put in the voltage regulator module as well, and the SIMs there, or whatever they're called, RDIMs, or I don't know, Call it what you want. And with that, we're pretty much all assembled, good to go. We'll have a closer look at the cards here, a modem and the video card. And yes, that video card does have a tuner in it. And here you can see the memory module that actually came with the system. It's a 256 megabyte module. And with RAM bus, you always have to pair with either another chip or some sort of a blank. And actually the same goes for the second processor. This system originally came with one 800 megahertz processor, and it had this fake processor card, I can't remember the term offhand, that was in there, a processor plug or something. 
Now regarding the motherboard that I bought with the two processors and voltage regulator cards, here it is. This came out of a Compaq. We can see that this particular board also has a RAID card at the top, as you see there. I'll point out in just a second. That's a smart RAID card, apparently. And as noted, we did a series of upgrades. We did start out with a Pentium 3 single processor, 800 megahertz with 256 megabytes of memory. And we landed on a dual processor system, one gigahertz with one gigabyte of RAM. Let's talk about operating systems. But first, I want to give a shout out to Dell for having drivers on their website for this old Precision 220 workstation. Most impressive. Now, all of the operating systems that I installed on the system have something in common, and that is their support for multiple CPUs. So we won't see any Win 9X operating systems today, but we will see various NT-based operating systems, as well as a nice Linux operating system that you're going to love. Let's get this machine powered on, and I can show you some of the operating systems that we have installed going through the boot menu. The first operating system we're going to look at is Windows NT 3.51, and we'll get logged in here and reestablish our network shares, and we see the Program Manager. That's right. We have a 32-bit OS here with Program Manager. We can map to a network drive and browse around. We can also load up the Windows NT Diagnostics and see that indeed we do have two processors detected. If we go to the hardware and then we go to the CPU steppings, we can see there it is, two processors detected. So that's kind of cool. All right. We can also launch Internet Explorer just for fun and actually <laughs> connect up and stream some internet radio. Of course, I can't play it here for copyright reasons, but I think it's pretty cool that we can actually launch streaming audio using ProtoWeb here, as you see, in Retro Shoutcast, and we have loaded up Winamp so that we can listen to audio. Next, we'll load Windows NT 4.0. We'll get logged in here, and we can go and look at some of the various features here. If we go to Properties, we don't quite see as much, but we can see the memory and processor detected, though it's a bit cryptic in this version of Windows. And from there, we can also go and perhaps load an application. I'll just kind of fumble around here a little bit. And we'll pick on the oh, imaging application. And there it is. But yeah, kind of neat. We can also load up Internet Explorer and go to, I don't know, Frog Find, for example. And we can see that indeed we are browsing the web on this nice system running Windows NT 4.0. Next, we'll load up Windows 2000, which is a classic absolutely wonderful os i love everything about it i love its startup screen it's a stable os we can go to properties and see an equally cryptic processor detected and one gigabyte of memory we can go over to the hardware and look at the device manager if we expand this out we'll see that a multi-processor pc has been detected so that's cool very nice and we can see the other various devices that we have as well we can also go to task manager and if i press f5 a bunch we can see activity on both CPUs. Very cool. Next, we'll load Windows XP. Ah, uh, who doesn't love Windows XP? We can go to Properties here and see some more intelligent readouts as far as the type of computer and processor we have. If we go to Device Manager, we can also see we have a multiprocessor PC, and the processors are actually listed here in Device Manager. So there you have it. We're starting to get more clarity regarding this multiple CPU system we have. From there, we can go and play a game, we can launch pinball, and you can see that, well, I'm running this in real time, and it's pretty zippy. I think that things are loading about as fast on here as they would other systems, so I really can't complain. But yeah, from there, we can play a little bit of pinball. I'll just, you know, shoot the ball here, and we'll just let it tilt real quick just to kind of see it interactive. But yeah, this is a great game that I used to play on Windows XP on occasion. And there you can see it. We'll just go ahead and tilt out here and end it. But yeah, uh, pretty nice, pretty zippy, runs pretty well. Next, we'll load Windows Server 2003, which isn't a particular user experience interesting OS, but I did want to include it just for fun. So here it is, it starts up, it shows you your server configuration page, and we can go and look at Device Manager as well, like we did in Windows XP. If we do that, we're going to see some things that are very similar to what we saw in XP, since this is 
an OS that is very much so aligned with Windows XP. We can see the processor detected there. If we go to the device manager, we can see that we have a multiprocessor uh, system and that we have some processors listed there as well. So there you have it. It's uh, just a little bit more bland than XP, but all of the nuts and bolts are there. Next up, I have a real treat for you, Hannah Montana Linux. Yes, guard your eyes, the colors are terrible. <laughs> but this is based on an old version of Kubuntu, I believe. We can load up a terminal here and look at our dual processors because yes, this is SMP compatible. And once we print this out, you'll see we have two genuine Intel Pentium 3 Coppermine processors. Excellent. And much like we did in the NT3.51 a second ago, we can stream music in Hannah Montana Linux. And no, I will not stream Hannah Montana music. My eyes are hurting enough, I don't need to hurt my ears too. But we can go over here and tune in and it's gonna pop up this dialog here to open the playlist. And the playlist will open up in a Winamp clone called QMMP. Let's take that playlist and move it off to the side there so we can see the full app. But how cool is that? Now we're streaming music in Hannah Montana Linux. Well, anyway, that's what I had for you today. I hope you enjoyed this video. This is a really fun machine and I'm enjoying having it. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.